Welcome to the fourth and final episode of Making a Chef Knife. We're going to take this knife that we've worked on for the past three episodes and cover handle shaping and gluing and the final finishing and sharpening. When I'm making a simple knife like this, I like to glue the handle together before doing any major shaping on the handle. However, the front of the bolster really should be totally finished before any gluing is done. So I like to put a chamfer on the front of my bolsters for chef knives. Um, it makes a nice place to, to pinch and it also breaks up this 90 degree angle so that it's easier to clean the inside of that. Um, so to lay out the chamfer, I draw two parallel lines, parallel to the ricasso, on either side of the knife. And I, oops, I'll use a piece of steel or brass or what have you, it doesn't really matter. Lay it right on the ricasso and draw a line. That's going to be the start of uh, the chamfer at the front of the bolster. And then I'll do that with a thicker piece of steel and this will give me the, the end of the chamfer. I also find that the chamfer helps to line things up um, when you're shaping, but we'll get to that later. So I've drawn parallel lines on the front of the guard, um, and and our chamfer will will run from this point down to the bottom. But first we're going to take off the material on the on the outside of our wider lines. Um, so we'll do that right on the grinder with a work rest. So I've roughed in the chamfer on this using, using the, the, the narrow lines as my guide for the top and trying to leave a, a similar margin on both sides. And now I go back to my surface plate again with the 220 grit sandpaper and I can make this chamfer, um, I, I, I can just even everything out. It's hard to get anything totally flat on the grinder because uh, the belt is moving so much. So this is much more accurate. And again, I'm moving my lines, moving my sanding lines, um, or I'm moving the ridges uh, uh, and, and facets just by the way that I apply pressure with my hands and with my fingers. I'm checking to make sure that the 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 line is the same on on both sides that this this margin between the bottom and the facet are 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 the same. We want everything to be as parallel and symmetrical as possible.
And once you think you have it close, um, it can help to go to a finer grit. Curly 600 grit sandpaper. <laughs> And I want to sand until all of the grinder and 220 grit lines are erased. The front of this bolster is going to be uh, its final finish before we do any gluing. You see that the finer grit makes it easier to see uh, whether this line is consistent. And it's fairly consistent. It gets a little wider here, but I can see that that's actually a dip in the... It's because this uh, facet isn't straight. So I'm going to let that go. Um, but if any of the angles are uneven, it's going to be easier to see it and fix it now than when the knife is uh, all glued together and starting to be round. And the handle is round. So I'll do a quick uh, thousand grit. Okay, so that's fairly nice. I'm going to hit it gently on the buffer to, to really polish it up. You want to be careful with small parts like this on the buffer. Um, just use very, very light pressure because uh, if it catches, it'll fly somewhere in the shop and you'll never find it ever. So, so very light pressure and hold on tightly. <laughs> Luckily I found it, um, not too, too far away. Don't do that at home. take off any extra buffing compound with a little denatured alcohol.
All right, so now it's all shined up and ready to glue. Because we're just relying on epoxy to hold the knife together and no pins or screws or mechanical fasteners, I like to put some teeth in so that the epoxy really has something to grab onto. Um, and when it cures, it will form a, a solid piece that will lock in with the tang. So even if it's not relying on just adhesion, or so it's not re relying simply on its adhesive properties to the metal. So that should give the epoxy uh, plenty of, of purchase. Um, I'm just giving it a final wipe down with some denatured alcohol. Make sure there's really no grease on there at all. And I'm gonna I'm gonna briefly touch this on the surface plate. So here are all, are all our components. They've been uh, totally cleaned with uh, solvent and with abrasives to make sure that all, all the surfaces that are going to be touching epoxy are uh, going to have the best chance of a good me uh, mechanical bond. I use West Systems uh, G-Flex epoxy um, for, for my knives. I find it's a good combination of properties. It's very strong, uh, totally waterproof, and it has a fairly long set time but a short cure time, which is which is really handy. It gives you plenty of time to to get it to set up, um, but then you don't have to wait for days before uh, before doing any further work on the knife. I uh, if, if you if you're really Fastidious, you could use a um, use a, a, a scale or a, a measuring device to, to measure out the amount, but I tend to tend to just squeeze, just eyeball it uh, in terms of the volume, and I I've really never had issues with the epoxy not setting properly. Um, I'm gonna mix it very well, a minute or so is usually good practice. And there's, there's a three hour cure time for this, or three hour set time for this epoxy, so there's absolutely no rush. You can take as long as you need in the gluing. If, you, if you're using a five minute epoxy, wasting a minute stirring might not be the best investment of your time. So this looks pretty well mixed. Now, there's no pinhole or any way for air to escape from the handle when we put it onto the blade. So we want all of the epoxy to be down in the very bottom of the handle. Um, ideally, when we put this blade in, it will fill all of the gaps and overflow a little bit, and that will make us make it 
so that we know there are no air pockets whatsoever inside the handle. Um, so in order to do that, I typically drip it, try to drip it down the handle as best I can. Uh, let's see that. It was a little clumsy. Um, and you can shake it. You can shake it down to the bottom. If you can get it to drip nice and e evenly, it'll go down a little faster. Okay, now that we have uh, put most of the epoxy down into the handle, I'm just going to let this sit there, let the epoxy settle, and we can glue the other components of the knife. So, I'm going to take um, just a little bit of epoxy. And remember, since this is such a tight fit, you don't really need much epoxy at all right here. Just where the guard is going to be. Make sure it gets on those inside shoulders. I want to make sure there's not a whole lot of dust caught. It's not super important. Dust actually would make the epoxy stronger. Um, there we go. So that's on tightly. I'll take a Q-tip and just wipe up some of the excess right now. We'll, we'll clean it up more later. And now for the brass spacer. So I'll try to fill any gaps in the back with epoxy. Again, try to minimize any sort of air bubbles that there might be. Check the orientation. We have our, our little center punch marks, so those are going to go in the back and to the right. And that goes down just fine. So now, it's tempting to want to put epoxy all over the tang, but I don't feel that that's a way to get the best uh, adhesion because Oftentimes, if you have epoxy on the tang and try to stick it into the slot, it'll create a kind of hydraulic seal and trap air bubbles in there, and, uh, and sometimes the tang won't go all the way in if it's, if it's very well fit. Since we drilled the big hole, it wouldn't really be too much of a problem. But I like to leave a dry tang going into the epoxy, and because we've put so much epoxy in that hole, as the epoxy wells up around the tang, you'll know that it is filling all of the gaps. Um, so I'll just let it, let it slowly work its way down. And you should see epoxy coming out on all sides of the tang and of the spacer. And then we'll give it a good shove and 
and scrape off the excess. Okay, so uh, this would cure just fine, but to, to make sure that there are really no gaps, uh, it's important to clamp it. So I just use a bar clamp to clamp these uh, knives together. I'll put a piece of wood on the tip to keep it kind of held stationary. And I have a bunch of different sizes of um, angled blocks that fit around the the back of the block. And we'll just tighten that down, try to get everything pushing in the right direction. It doesn't take a whole lot of pressure, but you do want to make sure that you've taken out any gaps. Now you want to clean all of the excess epoxy off of the bolster. If there's a little bit on the handle side, it doesn't matter so much because it's going to get ground away. But if the epoxy sets on the bolster, then you've ruined your nice fit. Or the, you've ruined the nice finish that you put on the bolster, is what I should say. So to make sure you've gotten all the epoxy, sometimes um, solvents can be a good, they're a popular way to clean up the epoxy, but I, I actually prefer to just use a little oil. I use a little mineral oil, and any surface that the oil sticks to, the epoxy won't stick to, so it's a, it's a, it, it, it cleans it up just fine, and it doesn't leave any, um, or it, it won't wick into joints like, um, like an acetone or alcohol might. Uh, again, this is it's probably a probably a pretty minor benefit, really. I don't I don't know how much the oil would re or how much alcohol would really wick into a joint, but um, I don't have to worry about it this way. Now I look to make sure that all of these joints are totally filled. There are no gaps. Um, if there are gaps, it's not too late to take everything apart. But once the epoxy cures, you'll have to destroy stuff to take it apart. I'm satisfied with this clamping job. Uh, we've taken out any gaps that there uh, could have been, and so it's gonna be a nice tight fit. Now we can take this out of the vise, go place it wherever is convenient, and after a couple hours, once that epoxy has set, then we can uh, do the rest of the handle shaping. So I let the epoxy cure overnight, and then I removed it for the from the clamp, and now you can see that this bolster region of the knife is all clean because we cleaned it up nicely um, with mineral oil. And now it's time to shape the handle. So just like shaping the blade, we're going to be doing this on the belt grinder and we're going to go through the same series of steps essentially. So um, if you recall from the second video, the first process of shaping the blade was to grind the profile and so we're going to do that with the handle as well. With the handle I like to make sure that this curve from the blade continues into the handle. This is just an aesthetic um, kind of decision but it uh, I, I think it makes a very good looking knife. If the handle looks like it's too high or too low compared to the knife then it's it's 
it's not as pleasing to the eye. So there's not much that needs to be taken off the top here. Similarly, I want the curve of the handle to flow into the bottom here. I like it to have a little swell and then to have uh, to, to neck down a little bit to, to some kind of edge. And you can draw as much as you like on here, kind of kind of figure figure out where things need to be so that it will look good to your eye. You can play with where the peak of this, uh, the point of the palm swell is, where, the, where the, the point of the handle is. And in general, with handle design, um, personally I find that having smooth surfaces everywhere except for the very corners at the end uh, give you the most pleasing handle design, both ergonomically when you're holding it and visually. Um, the reason is these little points back here, even though you don't want sharp spots in your hand, these are behind where your hand will be when it's resting around the knife, and they give you a nice visual stop for where this handle ends. I see some beginner knife makers round off every surface of the handle, and it looks a little bit uh, potato-like. I don't think it really you know, emphasizes the, the, the shape of the knife quite as nicely. So. Now that we have this dr drawn, we're going to rough this shape out on the belt grinder. So here I've ground the handle to profile. I left the profile ever so slightly oversized uh, where it meets the ricasso. You, um, you, you notice that there's a tiny little bit of step here and here uh, before it uh, meets the blade. And, and I find that to be very attractive visually, but I also, uh, it's, it's very functional because, um, well, from the standpoint of making the knife, because these surfaces are totally finished and there's no reason to touch these surfaces with the grinding belt if you're not making the handle totally flush and just a little bit of step it maintains the line but breaks it up just a little bit I think it looks very nice um, aesthetically at least to my eye so now the next step is is to flatten these sides of the handle block so that they are um, so that they make a line that's parallel with the blade. The, it's, it's very easy to start shaping a handle and then at the end of the handle shaping realize that the handle is not parallel with the blade. So we want to make sure from step one that the handle is going to be totally parallel. Now, 
I use the bolster as my guide for figuring out uh, the, 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 the planes for the side of the handle because we, when we laid out our bolster, if you recall, we, we put a, a, a spacer and ground to the, to the line so we know that the bolster is perfectly centered and it's parallel with the ricasso of the knife. So as long, if we grind the knife to, to meet with the bolster here, and to have a straight line all the way up to the edge, then we can make sure that these planes, even though they won't be parallel, they will meet because we can put the knife on a flat surface and if the point is the same location on one side versus the other, same, the same height from the flat surface, then we'll know that uh, these, these planes meet at, at the point. Um, I hope that was clear. That was a, it's a little bit complicated, but it'll make sense once, once we start doing it. So you see I've ground these two planes. Now they're obviously not parallel, but that's fine because we want a, a, a flare to the handle anyway. Um, what's really important is that I ground them so that they just barely touch the bolster on the close side. So I know that they're, that they're parallel with the Ricasso, at least in this plane. And now I want to make sure that they're an even taper on both sides. So the way that I do that is I'll lay it on my granite surface plate. And right now the tip touches the, the ground if I just lay it there. But if I, uh, I, I use a block, just a, just a block of wood off, off the granite surface plate, and I'll make a line with the tip of the knife on the block of wood on one side, and then a line with the tip on the other. And I want those lines to line up perfectly because then I know that the, that the blade is centered on the handle. If they don't line up, then it means that I need to grind more on one side. And in this case, because we don't want to touch the front of, the, uh, of, of these handle planes, we're going to take whichever side scribes the lower line and grind a little bit away from the back side of it. So I can see that... Uh, this side of the handle 
is making a, a, a lower line. And as we remove a little bit material from back here, it will bring that tip up ever so slightly to meet that line. So again, uh, just like it was moving, moving the grind when we were grinding the blade, just applying pressure when it's on the platen, applying pressure toward the bottom rather than toward the top should walk that grind back ever so slightly. And again, this is the side we want to take material from. One side and the other side, and both the lines meet so we know that the handle is parallel with the blade. Now that this is done, well, that is, so this is just, this layout technique that I've just showed you is, is just a quick way to get a confident, good result uh, without too much headache and uh, time of do, doing it by eye on the grinder. You can also notice just another thing, now is a great time to check this fit on b between the bolster, the spacer, and the wood. There should really be no gaps whatsoever, and uh, as you can see, there aren't. So we're happy with that. The next step is shaping this handle into the round kind of cross section that it will be. Um, again, the hardest part of well any of knife making is 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 making it symmetrical, making it even. So. There are a couple tricks to grinding this uh, that, that I'll show you. Instead of just trying to start rounding it off, it's good to work it in, in sections to do facets. Basically make the handle an, octa an octagonal cross section and then to go back in and uh, round off the corners uh, subsequently. So I'm, I do most of my handle shaping on a 36 or 60 grit uh, aluminum oxide belt and I'm going to do this all on the grinder just um, just grind the corners at, uh, at at an angle so I have a 36 grit aluminum oxide belt on the grinder that's what I did these flats uh, with and that's what I'm going to do the majority of my shaping with as well um, 60 grit is often a little bit more forgiving on wood and they both work very quickly in order to get nice even curves on this handle, I'm going to work everything in uh, in stages. So first I'm going to go over the entire handle and make it an octagon in cross section. Right now it's rectangular in cross section. I'm going to take all the corners down, try to make it as even an octagon as possible. Some people like to have an octagonal uh, handle and if that's what you want then you can go and, and finish it from there. I'm going to go for a full rounded handle so I'm going to, I'm going to work in the oct octagonal cross section and then I'm going to go and round out all of those corners. So just make sure that you're always focusing on grinding the corner down. Uh, again, it's important to look all the time. There's a lot of this that can't be easily done with layout and, and you just have to rely upon your eye to get it as close as it can possibly be.
So here's a chef knife with octagonal handle. If you wanted to leave it an octagon, you just go up the grits from here. You don't really want to leave it a 36 grit finish. But it already feels nice in the hand. Um, it's got the general shape. I added a little bit of uh, sway to the handle back here just to, to, give it, to give it a little bit more shape. I don't want to totally even taper from bolster to butt. I neck it in just a little bit. And the, closest, the closer you get everything to perfectly symmetrical, the easier the rest of the rounding will be. So the next step, I'm still going to stay with this same 36 grit belt, but I'm going to take down all of these ridges to make it round. So here's the handle, all rounded, with the 36 grit belt. The last thing that I'm going to do before moving up in grit is to make a slight crown on the end of the knife. And the hardest part about that crown, again, is keeping it even. So one way to do it is we have a flat ricasso, at least it's pretty close. Putting that on a flat block and then with a with a, a marking device of the same height, you can do a similar layout technique to what we used to get the handle straight and mark on both sides. And now we have two lines. They're in line with the blade. So this shows us whether the handle is symmetrical, both in curvature here, but also it, it'll allow us to make the facets that we need uh, in order to make a nice even curve.
So I took the platen off of my grinder, so now the, the, we're working on a slack belt. The belt gives, and that'll help um, get nice even curves and help blend all of the, the different facets from the previous grinding into one another. This is a, hundred, this is a 220 grit belt. 120 would work fine too. Um, we just want to make sure that we remove, remove all of the 36 grit scratches and get a nice smooth finish before moving up to our final grits. Um, it's just as important as ever not to touch the belt to the blade. Again, the blade is entirely finished, so we, we, we want to make sure that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get hurt by the belt. Some people like to wrap their knife blades when they're uh, shaping the handle, and, uh, and I sometimes do that, but I also find that wrapping the blade makes it difficult to see what's straight and what's not and uh, the blade wrapping often gets in the way. So I usually find it's, at least these days, that <laughs> it's easy enough to come back in with a little bit of sandpaper to take out any tiny minor scratches that might have happened because you lay it down on some, uh, something sharp on the table. Um, when we're working in all these tight corners, just be absolutely positive that the blade is not going to come and touch, come in contact with the with the grinder belt. It, uh, one technique, if, especially starting out, is is actually to to check and see how how it feels to move the knife on the grinder before the grinder is even running. That that way you can get a sense for the angles that you have to hold the blade at and which where you need to be careful uh, in order to get the kind of shaping that you want.
So here's the handle ground at 220. I ground all of it except for this little area right here. This is a fairly tight curve, and to do that with a slack belt is, is uh, difficult at a lower grit, so I'm going to actually wait till 320 grit to get into that tight curve. I also did exactly what I said not to do, and I hit the spine with the belt. Um, so I have these lovely 220 grit scratches here, so I'm going to have to go back with my 400 grit sandpaper and sand those out, uh, which is a hassle and it wastes time, so reinforcing why not to do that. Um, the other thing I should say about slack belting is, slack, slack belt grinding is that different materials wear away at different speeds. When you're working on a platen, it's not quite as noticeable, but when you're working on a slack belt, it is very noticeable. And if you have a metal bolster here especially, the wood will wear away much more quickly. So whenever you're slack belting and want to get a nice even transition without undercutting the wood, you need to focus on grinding primarily the metal portion, or uh, in this case, the phenolic uh, composite portion. Uh, Again, this is softer than metal, so it makes it a little bit easier, and brass is fairly soft, so this is, this is not too hard of a transition to, to do. But if I had a stainless steel bolster here, I would need to grind primarily on the stainless steel, and the wood would come, come down to meet it very easily and quickly uh, after the stainless steel was shaped. And the, the undercutting is another reason why I do the, about 90% of the shaping on the platen. The, the slack belt is really just to, to, to get a final smooth finish. The final belt that I'm going to use on the handle before hand sanding is a 320 grit J-Flex belt, uh, so it's a flexible backing. The 220 was as well. Um, the reason I use a worn out belt for this is that it actually burnishes the surface and leaves a really nice finish. And, uh, and it also means that it doesn't cut quite so quickly, so you can cut into, you, you can apply a little bit more pressure and work into those tight corners uh, more easily. I also run it at a very, very slow pace, uh, particularly if I'm working on any end grain. A, belt, a dull belt running slowly will cut just fine, um, but a dull belt running quickly will tend to burn the material and, and uh, that leaves some unsightly marks that are difficult to sand out.
Some people have fancy fixtures. I do most of my hand sanding of handles on my knee. Uh, it's a nice soft, uh, non-marking surface. And uh, it's easy enough to just rotate the handle in one hand while sanding with the other. I'm starting at 600 grit. This is um, the 320 grit belt leaves a really fine finish already that's nearly good enough to sell, but I think that uh, going over it once more with hand sanding paper helps to catch any imperfections that might be there. Uh, maybe more of a confidence builder than anything else, but it'll teach you about your grinding. If you find that it's not, that, that certain parts aren't symmetrical, because you have to look over everything when you're sanding. If you find that anything's wrong, then you, you, you can always go back to the grinder and fix it, but it teaches you what, what to focus on next time. So here's our handle, sanded to 600 grit, and uh, there are a lot of different ways to get a nice finish on a piece of wood, and I, I uh, can't pretend to, to cover all of them uh, here, but what I, what I chose to do with this one is just uh, let it soak in some linseed oil for a couple of hours, uh, really as long as you like and then it needs to cure for, for quite a while if it's linseed oil. Other, there are other penetrating oils that work a little bit more quickly, but I like the way that linseed oil tends to darken walnut, so it's my uh, particular choice for here. After the oil, often a little bit of uh, steel wool can help to, to really bring out the luster of the, the piece, So, and, and take out any, any raised grain that might happen. I usually rub in line with the grain except uh, around the bolster because I want to make the, the abrasion lines uh, parallel with the spacer. Um, that's, I, f I find it just, it helps the, the look of the knife. Uh, one last thing before this knife is, is pretty much complete. Um, is this edge here, we've left it nice and crisp, which looks very lovely, but I like to just soften that edge ever so slightly, so I'll round it a little bit with uh, 600 grit sandpaper. Notice I'm waiting to do this till the very last minute. You can do this before uh, putting an oil finish on it, um, that's fine, but you want to make sure that the handle is entirely shaped before doing this last little sanding bit. And the reason is that that crisp edge really helps to make sure that all of your lines are, um, or, so make, make sure that all the, the, the curves meet evenly. It's much easier to read a crisp line than it is to read a, a, a slightly radiused one. So I'm just taking this 600 grit paper and uh, just gently rounding that over. So to the eye, it will still read as a sharp transition, but it will be a little softer in the hand and it'll also make it a little bit stronger. Wood is a soft material and sharp corners are particularly fragile. And try to make 
a fairly even radius all over. just a tiny bit more at the top here. So now I just need to take out any any little minor scratches that may have uh, gotten into the blade during the shaping process. Now the blade's all cleaned up, so just wiping it with a little denatured alcohol to get rid of any oil. Make sure that it's, uh, it's the way it wants to be. So the, the knife is essentially finished right now, um, but I'm going to add one more little feature. This is a, a kind of next level knife making trick, which is going to be to make uh, what we call a heritage fit between the three pieces of material here. When wood is exposed to different conditions, humidity and temperature, it will tend to shrink and expand. And when it shrinks and expands, it will make this transition no longer smooth. The smooth transition is really nice, but once you have a little step there, it can sometimes feel sharp against the hand. So what a lot of knife makers do, and what I often do, is, is round those transitions ever so slightly to make it so that if the wood shrinks or expands just a little bit, you won't notice, at least tactilely. Not in a tactile way. Is tactilely a word? I don't know. Um, so to, to do this, it's easiest if you make the knife uh, what we call takedown construction. So you can finish all of the pieces and then take them apart and then round all the edges and then put them all back together. But we can't do this because we've already glued the thing together. So what I do is I use a, a, a three-corner file. This is a, a saw file uh, intended for sharpening hand saws and I grind off one side of it and that makes these edges very sharp. And it makes it a little bit easier to control where the file is going. So then all you need to do essentially is file a little groove 
that lines up exactly with the transition between the brass and the bolster and the transition between the brass and the wood. And this doesn't need to be a very deep groove, just enough to give a little bit of definition to the pieces. Um, but you do want to be very careful not to let the file slip because all of our pieces are finished at this point. First couple file strokes are the most critical.
Now I'm switching to a, a number two cut, uh, so a fairly fine uh, flat file. Sharp file makes all the difference. One file slip can mean five minutes of cleanup, so it's best to minimize the number of file slips, otherwise you end up spending hours trying to repair your mistakes. So now I've moved to a number four file, which is the finest file that I have, really. It's still a flat file. And uh, I went through all of the grooves. Essentially, they're two V grooves, about 90 degrees each. Um, and then, so that leaves some ridges. And now, just like we were when we were shaping the handle, I'm rounding the ridges uh, ever so slightly with the file. Uh, the more you do with the file, the less you have to do with sandpaper. Sandpaper tends to round things, um, and it won't get down into the bottom of the groove quite as easily. And the finish on that, that comes from a number four file is uh, pretty on par with uh, like the 600 grit sandpaper that we were working with. It's a, it's a different looking finish. Uh, but we should be able to just touch it with touch it with the sandpaper or even the steel wool and make it look nice after it's all shaped properly.
So now I'm just sanding with a thousand grit sandpaper. Um, this is just a little triangular cross section sanding block with nice sharp corners uh, that are all a little bit less than 90 degrees, which helps get into that into those sharp corners. You have to move the sandpaper fairly often because when you're working in a tight corner like this, it wears out very quickly. And here's our finished knife.